morning friends uh, we are going to discuss fmg january 2024 questions in this session there are around 40 questions asked from surgery and allied subjects so we are going to discuss around 40 questions in this uh, module so let us see all the following are seen in refeeding syndrome except so i hope you all would have read it's a repeat question refeeding syndrome so refeeding syndrome all of the following are seen except hypophosphatemia hypokalemia hyperkalemia hypocalcemia so please understand in patients who are on TPN following a malnourishment, for example, he has underwent some surgery and we started a TPN for a patient who has not taken any food for past few days. Such patients, what happened? TPN contains glucose. So what happens? This glucose will stimulate insulin. Insulin is produced in excess and the function of insulin now is to drive the potassium into the cells. It drives the potassium into the cells that is the function of insulin it drives potassium into the cells therefore there is hypokalemia so therefore there is hypokalemia and hypokalemia induced arrhythmia and congestive cardiac failure can happen so hypokalemia arrhythmia and congestive cardiac failure will happen because of this massive electrolyte shift of potassium Similar to potassium, there are so many other electrolytes also shift from extracellular to intracellular. They are given by a mnemonic PCM. So, there is a, a shift of phosphate, calcium and magnesium. So, hypophosphatemia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia. So, all these are seen in those patients. So, what are all the other electrolytes which are lost means there is also loss of hypophosphatemia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia. So, three more electrolytes are lost, phosphate, calcium, magnesium. So, three more electrolytes are lost. Therefore, refeeding syndrome is characterized by hypokalemia, phosphatemia, calcemia, magnesemia. So, which is not seen here is, please understand, it's a repeat MCQ, hyperkalemia. So, this question has already asked in the exam. So, it's a repeat EC question in this exam. So, now a patient is diagnosed with a squamous cell cancer of the skin which is not involving the lymph nodes. So, squamous cell cancer of the skin, they didn't mention which place. So, let us assume it is a squamous cell cancer somewhere in the upper limb. They have not mentioned it. where is it. So, let us assume this is a squamous cell cancer in the upper limb. So, what will I do for this squamous cell cancer? So, please remember for basal cell cancer and squamous cell cancer, margin clearance given is 4 to 6 millimeters. For a skin cancer, margin clearance given on all three dimensions is 4 to 6 millimeters for basal cell cancer and squamous cell cancer. When it is a melanoma, it is a malignant melanoma, the margin clearance given is 1 to 2 centimeter. Margin is given on all the three dimensions. So, accordingly, this patient I will give a 4 to 6 millimeters and I removed the tumor. In all the three dimensions, I have given 4 to 6 millimeters and I have removed the tumors. Now, how will I close this defect? Please understand, the defect is about to be closed. So, if it is about to be closed, it is easily closed with the help of skin grafting. So, skin grafting is enough. So, if it is in some other place except face, if it is in the face, if the same clearance is done in the face, I will try to do a full thickness graft because it is cosmetically good. So, if it is done in the face, I will do a full thickness graft. If it is done in the peripheries or other places, I will go for a partial thickness graft. So, do not forget, I will go for a partial thickness graft. So, this is enough. So, please understand many students would, might, be, might, might have answered uh, as void local excision with the flap repair. See, flap repair, what is the indication of flap? It's just a void local, actually the correct answer is skin grafting with void local excision. That, sh that should be the correct answer. So, I do not know whether the recall had a wide local excision with the skin grafting. So, ideal answer is D, a wide local excision with the skin grafting. So, the point here you should not forget is flaps are not needed. Flaps will be used in places where there is a flaps are used in places where there is no blood supply used on bones, tendon or any composite defect. Only in these places we use flap. Otherwise, we can use the skin graft itself that is enough. Just a simple skin graft is enough in most of the places. Flaps are used only in bones, tendons and composite defect areas. Please do not forget this basic point. And second question is a simple easy question for your exam.
Third question, patient after road traffic accident was brought to emergency. His pulse rate is 50 per minute. See, pulse rate is decreased. Okay, very important. BP is 80 by 60. So, blood pressure is decreased. On evaluation, his ECG is normal. And E-fast is normal. X-ray chest is normal. So, all these points are given to say you E fast normal, X ray just normal means there is no bleeding inside. So, there is no chances of hemorrhagic shock. That is what the examiner wants to make Q clear. So, no chances of hemorrhagic shock from these two points. And ECG normal, it implies there is no cardiogenic shock. There is no evidence of cardiogenic shock. That is why ECG is also normal. So, most important point here is. Usually, in cardiogenic shock, uh, hemorrhagic shock, there will be increased pulse rate and decreased BP. Please do not forget, there will be increased pulse rate and decreased BP in hemorrhagic as well as cardiogenic shock. The only shock where you have hypotension with the bradycardia is a repeat question, last year neat PG question. So, it is neurogenic shock. So, neurogenic shock is a shock where there is decreased pulse rate and Hypotension. So, bradycardia with hypotension. Bradycardia plus hypotension is seen in neurogenic shock. So, do not forget this point. So, bradycardia with hypotension is seen in neurogenic shock. So, the answer is C. Simple question. A patient was brought to emergency after RTA. He was wearing a signs of seat belt abdominal trauma was present. So, seat belt injury. So, the concept is related to seat belt injury. In a seat belt injury, patient now has guarding and rigidity on examination of the abdomen. What should be considered? What injury is considered in this patient? So, can you tell me what is the most common organ injured in seat belt injury? It is mesentery. Please don't forget, it is mesentery. See, for example, this is a bowel and this is the mesentery. This is the mesentery. You all know very well, the blood vessels to the bowel are running through the mesentery like this. If there is a laceration like this horizontally, what will happen? Horizontal laceration will damage the blood flow to the bowel and this bowel will develop gangrene and this can go for gangrene and perforation. So, gangrene and perforation can happen in mesenteric tear. So, this patient therefore had a hollow viscous injury that is why there is classical finding known as guarding and rigidity. Guarding rigidity is seen in hollow viscous injury. Hollow viscous injury is not a direct viscous injury. It is usually due to mesenteric injury causing loss of blood supply to the bowel. Okay. Uh, most common organ injured is mesentery. Second common organ injured is DJ flexure of bowel. So, DJ flexure of bowel can also directly get perforated. So, both injuries, whatever it is, both mesenteric injury or a direct bowel injury, there is leaking of the contents which is going for guarding and rigidity. So, do not forget this is a simple question asking you about what is the common organ injured in this list. Okay, This is a classical finding of hollow viscous injury in a mesenteric tear. So, mesenteric tear can be longitudinal or transverse which is dangerous. Longitudinal tear or transverse tear. So, longitudinal tear is less dangerous. For example, if it is a tear like this, usually the blood supply is maintained. So, it is less dangerous, whereas transverse tear is more dangerous. It is a Ames question. So, in a mesenteric tear, which tear is dangerous means it is transverse tear, which is more dangerous. Please do not forget this point. Okay, This is a very important point for your exam. So, and every year we see this question following the ima following image on CT scan is suggestive of dash. Following image on CT scan is suggestive of what hemorrhage. So, this is a picture showing you there are three types of hemorrhages we commonly see in CT scan EDH, SDH, SCH. So, EDH due to middle meningeal artery injury, SDH due to bridging vein injury, bridging veins injury. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is due to bleeding into the subarachnoid space. There is a bleeding into the subarachnoid space. Subarachnoid space is having blood collection. So, when you do a lumbar puncture in these cases, you can get a xanthochromic CSF. 
xanthochromic CSF is seen in subarachnoid hemorrhage due to bleeding into the CSF collection area. So, therefore, subarachnoid space is having hemorrhage. So, this is a classical three cases. In this, EDH will have a biconvex hemorrhage like this. EDH has a biconvex hematoma, repeat MCQ. Biconvex hematoma is seen in EDH. Concavo convex as shown in the image. So, this is concavo convex seen in acute SDH. It is concavo convex. See, acute SDH is usually due to severe well, high velocity injury, high velocity injury in which there is an acceleration and deceleration. There is an injury where there is acceleration plus deceleration happened. So, high velocity injury with acceleration deceleration is called as acute SDH. So, do not forget this acute SDH. Biconvex EDH is usually due to fracture of Tyrion bone, fracture of Tyrion bone which is the thinnest bone. So, any injury in the skull usually causes fracture in the Tyrion part of temporal bone and it causes collection of blood inside. So, EDH is due to fracture of Tyrion, SDH is due to high velocity acceleration and deceleration injury. So, do not forget this is a concavo convex. So, the answer is subdural hematoma. So, this is a very common question. Every year they ask you an x-ray chest question from surgery or from radiology. So, a 15 year old boy which is the most likely pathology in the x-ray given in the picture below. So, this is an x-ray. In this x-ray you are seeing there is a haziness of the right lung. So, right lung is not seen. The right side there is haziness of right lung. And in this picture, if you very closely observe, you can see the trachea is shifted to the right side. So, this is probably due to some foreign body causing obstruction of this bronchus. Right bronchus is having an obstruction. Therefore, probably what happened? This side lung got atelectasis. So, that is a classical picture. So, this is a picture of right lung atelectasis. Right lung atelectasis. So, there are three more pictures I want you to understand in x-ray chest. X-ray chest showing haziness on the right side. Number one, this is a picture showing you atelectasis. In atelectasis, there is right side haziness. There is trachea sh shifted to same side. This is atelectasis. The third picture closely observed, there is a tracheal shift to the opposite side. Tracheal shift is to the opposite side and same haziness is present. What is the cause? So, trachea shifted to opposite side. So, trachea to opposite side with the picture of x-ray showing haziness of the right side. This is a classical finding of hemothorax. Hemothorax following a trauma there is a collection of blood that shifts the uh, lung to the opposite, shifts the mediastinum to the opposite side. So, there is trachea shifted to opposite side. And this haziness here with the trachea in the midline, you can see the trachea in midline. So, trachea in midline trachea, this is usually a collection of fluid known as usually pleural effusion. So, moderate pleural effusions, you can see the S-shaped curve of Ellis. You would have read in medicine, you will see a S-shaped curve of Ellis. Ellis curve will be present in pleural effusion. So, Trachea is going to decide the haziness. If it is trachea deviated to the same side, it is atelectasis. Opposite side is hemothorax. In the midline, it is a new pleural effusion. So, classical picture of these three diseases. This question is showing you a lung atelectasis due to lung collapse, okay, due to some foreign body. A patient presented to hospital complaining that on walking a certain distance, he felt pain in his cough because of which he cannot walk any further distance and has to take rest as per Boyd's grading. So, Boyd's classification of claudication pain. This is a simple question on Boyd's grading of claudication pain. It is a question on claudication pain. Boyd's classification of claudication pain. So, please understand there are four grades. Grade 1. A patient starts walking. He gets pain, walks with the pain and pain disappears. It is called as disappearing pain. He gets a pain, he disappears after walking for some distance due to substance P which accumulated is washed out. So, substance P is washed out that is grade 1. 
grade 2 the patient starts walking he gets a pain he walks with a limp he walks with a limp that is known as limping pain but he completes his job he completes his job by walking with the limp grade 3 is a patient who starts walking he gets pain and it makes him sit it compels him to rest so compelling to rest compelling to rest is grade 3 on rest pain disappears so no pain disappears as the patient takes rest pain disappears okay that is very important grade 4 is a person who is having pain even when he is simply lying down so that is known as rest pain not doing any job he is just lying down he is having pain usually this type of grade 4 patients will take an attitude of sitting with the legs down so he they will be lying in such a way they will be putting the legs down so hanging down hanging down legs can be noted so hanging down legs are noted in grade 4 so grade 4 is complete rest pain so now in this question a patient has a pain he felt pain in his cough region because of which he cannot walk any further and has to take rest so therefore it is not rest pain he is taking rest therefore it is 3 grade 3 cases this is Boyd's grading of claudication pain in peripheral vascular disease it is a topic of peripheral vascular disease Okay, please do not forget this cause. Peripheral vascular disease getting pain. A patient is on bed rest after cholecystectomy. She developed fever and respiratory distress three days later. Which of the following patients pathology best explains the patient's condition? So, this is a classical patient status post surgery. Patient following a surgery is in bed rest. A patient following surgery going for bed rest develops what problem? Patient develops DVT. It is usually seen on 4th post-op day. Usual cause of fever on 4th post-op day is DVT. They will be characterized by only fever and pain. But in this case, there is a clear symptom showing you breathlessness, which is a feature of pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism is a feature of breathlessness. Please do not forget, there is a feature showing you breathlessness. So, classical feature of DVT and pulmonary embolism are shown here. So, this patient underwent surgery go for DVT and develops pulmonary embolism. The classical answer here is which is the best pathology here is pulmonary embolism. So, pulmonary embolism manifests as breathlessness and you would have been reading more points about pulmonary embolism in medicine books. Okay. So, this is mostly a surgical and pathology question. 24 year old girl presented to OPD with a 2 into 3 centimeter mobile firm rubbery lump in the breast histopathological examination is given below what is the common diagnosis so i don't i am not worried about the histopathological appearance because as a surgeon i don't know to read pathological uh, features but this is a lobulated appearance on pathology but classical feature of indian rubbery consistency in a mobile lump indian rubbery consistency of a mobile lump called as breast mouse breast mouse is a feature of fibroadenoma please remember there are many updates in 28th edition fibroadenoma 28th edition says it falls under what birat's grading it is birat's 2 lesion so it is birat's 2 lesion no need of biopsy or surgery no need of any biopsy or even surgery is not needed for these patients so, fibrodenoma comes under Birat's to no need to go for surgery. So, when will I operate fibrodenoma? Very important indications. So, when the age is above 35 years, okay, when the age is above 35 years or when the fibrodenoma is more than 5 centimeter or if you have suspected mammography findings. So, mammography findings are not conclusive of Birat's 2. You are still having a doubt. It can be a malignancy so above 35 years more than 5 centimeters suspected mammography findings and patients will patient wants to do surgery so only in these four cases i will advise surgery surgery is done for the following four indications more than 35 years more than 5 centimeter suspected mammography and patients want surgery is a reason for operating a fibrodenoma otherwise fibrodenoma no need of any surgery and you all know the basic mcq fibrodenoma on mammography shows what calcification popcorn like calcification don't forget popcorn
calcification is seen on mammography. It's a repeat MCQ, old MCQ. So there are many clinical questions. They are not going for one-liners like olden days. A patient presented to surgical department with a slowly increasing swelling in front and below the ear and lifting the ear lobule. Which of the following surgery is most likely done? So this is a classical clinical feature of parotid tumor. Parotid tumors, what are the features? Number one, they lift ear lobule. Number one, then what other features are seen? They lift ear lobule, they obliterate retromandibular groove. Obliterate retromandibular groove. Number three, they have curtain sign positive. Curtain sign means I can move the swelling side to side, but I cannot move above the zygomatic bone. That is known as like a curtain, I can move side to side. That is known as curtain sign positive. Lift the ear lobule, obliterate retromandibular groove and curtain sign positive are the features of parotid tumors. 27th edition Bailey. 27th edition Bailey says for benign parotid tumors, if it is a benign parotid tumor, the treatment done for such cases is superficial parotidectomy. So this is from 27th edition Bailey, but 28th edition Bailey has updated some interesting points. That is why I am having a doubt whether this is a proper recall by the students because which of the following surgery is most likely done in this patient. There are very interesting points like superficial parotidectomy, enucleation, wide local ex wide excision with the primary repair. So wide excision with the reconstruction like that many points are added. New Bailey is giving now conservative parotidectomy is advised. Conservative parotidectomy is new update if it is from 28th edition please remember we can do a give a adequate margin and resect the tumor so it's a uh, with a good margin if it is a benign tumor like pleomorphic adenoma or warthin's tumor you can do excision of the tumor excision with adequate margin is enough that's a new update so whether there is a choice like this given in this exam or not i don't know but please remember there is a new change in Benign tumors of parotid, benign tumors of parotid, 27th edition was mentioning as superficial parotidectomy, but new edition is mentioning as conservative parotidectomy with adequate margin excision. The major advantage of this conservative parotidectomy is nerve injury is less, is avoided. So otherwise most commonly the facial nerve branches are injured. In conservative parotidectomy, we can limit the dissection of the tumor helps us to prevent injury of the various branches. So please remember this is a new update but as of now this question from these choices I will go for superficial parotidectomy. In future if you get a question on parotid tumors remember this conservative parotidectomy in your mind. So identify the following image shown here though this is a classical image showing you there is an ulcer in the face, ulcer in the face with a rolled out margin. See this is a picture showing you ulcer with a rolled out edges. Where will you get rolled out ulcer? Rolled out ulcer is basal cell cancer. Rolled out edges are seen in basal cell cancer. Where you will get everted edges? In squamous cell cancer, you get an everted edges. Where will you get an undermined ulcer like this? Undermined ulcer is seen in TB. Please don't forget, where will you get punched out ulcer like this? In syphilis. Syphilis, you get punched out ulcer. Syphilis and arterial ulcers are punched out. Where will you get sloping edge like this? Sloping edge. Sloping edge is seen in venous ulcer. See, very simple concept. So, this is a picture showing you rolled out and beaded edges of basal cell cancer in the face. Simple question, okay. Punched out in syphilis, everted edge in squamous cell, sloping edge in venous ulcer. It's a repeat MCQ. It's a basic second MBBS level question. So, please don't make mistake in this. In RTA, patient presented with a crushed limb after trauma. A result, as a result of crushed limb, myonecrosis, amputation, crushing injury and myonecrosis, amputation was performed for the patient. Three days later, he comes to you with redness and swelling over the site and examination shows there is soft tissue necrosis and crepitus, most likely diagnosis of this patient. So you all will be very clear, there are two important uh, infections we should not forget. One is gas gangrene. So gas gangrene is a, is a very common microbiology question caused by Clostridium, Clostridium organism whereas there is another one known as necrotizing fasciitis, 
necrotizing fasciitis is caused by beta hemolytic streptococci initially initially but later it becomes polymicrobial many organisms are involved in necrotizing fasciitis very important point i want to tell you here is gas gangrene has history of trauma and patient is not immunocompromised patient patient is not immunocompromised patient he has had a nasty trauma that's all he is not immunocompromised he had a nasty trauma very bad injury that has gone for entry of the soil the soil commensal clostridium enters the wound that is clostridium causing gas gangrene whereas necrotizing fasciitis is always seen in immunocompromised patients it happens spontaneously there is no specific history of any uh, any injury so there is spontaneously it can happen necrotizing fasciitis can happen spontaneously so gas gangrene on examination will have crepitus necrotizing fasciitis on examination will have skin gangrene dish water pus coming out will be coming out from this necrotizing fasciitis it is a rapidly spreading subcutaneous infection please remember it is rapidly spreading infection necrotizing fasciitis so what should i do for this gas gangrene gas gangrene patients immediately i should do anti gas gangrene serum very high mortality please remember anti gas gangrene serum is given serum immunoglobulin is given for this patients and we have to give hyperbaric oxygen so hyperbaric oxygen and anti gas gangrene serum is given for these patients whereas for necrotizing fasciitis we should do debridement extensive debridement of the necrotic tissues extensive debridement is done so this patient is having crepitus so i will go with gas gangrene so don't forget gas gangrene and necrotizing fasciitis which of the following have maximum chances of graft versus host disease this are two types of rejections you should not forget one is graft rejection okay graft rejection for example this is mr ramu who had an organ from mr somu the organ received by ramu is a kidney okay he is having a kidney now he is having one kidney received from somu so this kidney is a foreign organ for ramu so what will this kidney do so this kidney is now a foreign organ therefore ramu's body will produce um, t lymphocytes T lymphocytes are produced by this by this guy, and they are they are known as cell mediated immunity. Cell mediated immunity. It is an immunity in our body. When something foreign body comes to our body, our body will fight against it. So therefore, as a part of cell mediated immunity, we are fighting against this uh, against this kidney. So that is by releasing interleukin two is released in enormous amount. and that will go and reject this kidney so that will go and reject this kidney this kidney i don't want this kidney this is so much kidney i don't want so it will reject so this interleukin 2 released and rejection of this kidney is known as graft rejection it can be easily cured by immunosuppressants if i give immunosuppressants like cyclosporin tacrolimus etc etc this interleukin 2 will be inhibited and there is no organ rejection so this organ rejection is seen in kidney uh, very commonly so there is another disease this question is not asking about this this is the question is asking graft versus host disease here ramu received an organ from mr somu the organ he received is not kidney but he received a small bubble for example this is a small bubble he received small bubble transplant understand a very important point small bubble is having so many lymphocytes small bubble is having so many lymphocytes and antibodies so this 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 graft which is kept inside will now reject ramo so this is huge amount of lymphocytes so this will reject ramo this is called as graft rejecting the host so this is known as gvhd it is most commonly seen in small bowel because of the extensive lymphatic seen in small bowel so please understand the answer is intestine so the huge amount of lymphocytes present in the small bowel like pyes patches etc will reject the graft is going to reject the host if host rejects the graft it is graft rejection which is common phenomenon it is more common phenomenon very very rare is graft itself rejecting the host is very 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 rare phenomenon so gvhd the only option is we have to remove the graft we have to remove the graft 
sometimes we need to remove the graft sometimes we have to decrease the immunosuppressants many treatments are there but it is beyond the level of uh, fmg exam just remember gvhd is common in small bowel this is a carry home mcq for lifetime okay a newborn baby was having difficulty in breathing and on evaluation there are multiple air fluid levels in the left hemithorax what will be the most likely diagnosis see for your exam i want to tell you four baby questions will come very commonly newborn baby questions one is tracheoesophageal fistula another is congenital diaphragmatic hernia another is meconium ileus newborn cases meconium ileus another is what meconium ileus and another one is midgut valvulus four emergency cases four emergency cases in a newborn baby please remember four emergency cases in a newborn baby the history is very clear tracheoesophageal fistula a newborn baby will have drooling saliva when i pass the rail tube through the nose the rail tube is coiling of rail tube seen okay simple question that is tracheoesophageal fistula congenital diaphragmatic hernia the patients will have breathlessness when i give bag and mask there will be more breathlessness please don't forget when i am going to give bag and mask it will cause more breathlessness so breathlessness bag and mask aggravates the breathlessness and when i take an x ray x ray shows bogdalak hernia left side will have multiple bowel loops x ray shows left side bowel loops meconium ileus is seen in babies with a cystic fibrosis cystic fibrosis baby they never pass meconium for more than 48 hours meconium is not passed so when i take when i see the baby they having abdomen distension when i take an x ray abdomen please understand there is no air fluid level that is because there is no fluid at all that is a dry meconium so no air fluid level seen in x ray abdomen that is a very important point in meconium ileus meconium ileus thick dry meconium obstructs the small bowel and absorbs all the fluid which is available in a cystic fibrosis patient they have no air fluid level so midgut valvulus is another interesting condition in which the baby will come to you with the bilious vomiting very dangerous bilious vomiting and on x ray on a bilious vomiting if i take x ray there are multiple air fluid levels seen in these cases there are multiple air fluid levels seen so investigation of choice for this case is gastrographin study i have to give gastrographin for the baby to swallow and take the x ray so that i can find out the valvulus in the bowel so these four cases are very commonly asked mcqs for fmg exam tracheoesophageal fistula congenital diaphragmatic hernia meconium ileus midgut valvulus don't forget this so what will be the most likely diagnosis in this patient with the multiple air fluid levels in left side chest is congenital diaphragmatic hernia okay no confusion in this so 15th question is a complete new update for bailey and lau uh, from bailey and lau new question for your exams this question proximal dislocation of squamo columnar junction i don't think this question is a proper recall probably they would have kept as esophago gastric junction so proximal dis, dis, uh, dislocation of esophago gastric junction so let me draw you the normal anatomy of esophagus and stomach so this is esophagus okay this is og junction and this is stomach please understand the line i am making now is a og junction that is a og junction esophago gastric junction now i am going to show you one two types of hernias two types of hiatus hernia there are four types i am not going to discuss everything here if you want full detail you can read the regular module in the first type you can see the stomach is going through the hiatus like this so og junction is shifted up like this so the stomach is going into the mediastinum like this you can see og junction is shifted proximally and the patients will have grd symptoms this is type 1 hiatus hernia called as sliding hiatus hernia the type 1 hiatus hernia called as sliding hiatus hernia this is type 1 hiatus hernia so second picture if you see here very interesting the og junction is there in the abdominal cavity only you can see the og junction is here only but what happened some part of stomach enters like this some part of stomach enters like the og junction is here some part of stomach entered and this is known as type 2 hernia also known as rolling hiatus hernia or 
para esophageal hernia so rolling or para esophageal hernia there are many other hernias like type 3 is mixed of both type 4 is massive para esophageal hernia massive para esophageal hernia there are four types so most important point here you should not forget this actually a repeat question of previous aims exam what is this angle known as angle of his old mcq in aims is in which of these four hernias angle of his is normal angle of his is normal and type 2 hernia angle of his is normal and type 2 hernia in otherwise angle of his is altered in all other hernias angle of his you can see here it is not altered in type 2 hernia so the answer here is proximal dislocation of squamocolumnar junction is seen in sliding hiatus and a simple question so don't get confused it's a simple question asking you about sliding hiatus and yeah, the OG junction is shifted to the chest okay so this is a very important concepts you should not forget for your exams uh, please don't forget a chronic male patient presented to emergency with a sudden onset of epigastric pain radiating to the back so which is aggravated on lying down so patient is therefore leaning forward known as Muhammad prayer sign these are all questions which has no excuse if you have made a mistake. So pain is aggravated on lying down. So he will be sitting with the leaning forward. Serum amylase lipase increased. So it is a case of acute pancreatitis. So don't forget this history. Very classical acute pancreatitis. In case I am giving you some scenarios. A patient has an epigastric and retrosternal pain. Epigastric and retrosternal pain radiating to the interscapula. Shooting pain. Shooting pain to interscapular region what is the cause yes it is aortic dissection very good it is aortic dissection so if you have answered it aortic dissection you are excellent you have prepared well it is due to aortic dissection you have pain in the uh, central chest radiating to the interscapular region aortic dissection pain in the right hypochondrium right hypochondrium radiating to right side back to right side back so from here it radiates to the right side back it is nothing but cholecystitis so you can get questions like this pancreatitis aortic dissection cholecystitis all these patients there will be some clinical clues from the history you should never make mistake in these type of questions it's a classical question on acute pancreatitis please don't forget there will be history questions related to the history so clinical symptom related questions will be at least 30 percent in surgery so you should understand all the disease and read you will never make mistake so which of the following is the most common complication of endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography ERCP what is a common complication see please understand this is the ampoule of water and this is bile duct and this is pancreatic duct so in ERCP I am going to use a side viewing endoscopy like this this is a side viewing endoscopy with the side viewing endoscopy I am going to cannulate the ampulla and I am going to push the contrast to the bile duct and pancreatic duct and I will study the pancreatic duct and bile duct by pushing contrast with the help of side viewing scopy. So when I am going to push the contrast into the pancreatic duct, pancreatic duct gets irritated and gets 5% cases can develop acute pancreatitis. That is the most common complication. So most common complication is acute pancreatitis. So sometimes along with the ERCP, I will also do sphincterotomy. So ERCP, I will do sphincterotomy means I will cut the sphincter of OD. So I will cut the sphincter of OD at 11 o'clock position. I should cut R at 1 o'clock position. Which position will you cut is 11 o'clock or in 1 o'clock position, I should cut the sphincter of OD and I will do some procedures. For doing some procedures like for stenting or taking biopsy, I may do sphincterotomy. So when I do ERCP plus sphincterotomy is combined means those patients can develop with a, for, a, for a CBD stone. If I do it for a CBD stone, those patients can commonly develop cholangitis. Cholangitis is most common when I do a procedure. When I do only ERCP, it is pancreatitis. When I try to do some procedure, it is cholangitis and sepsis. So this is from Bailey and Law. So when there is a procedure done, it will cause cholangitis. So here they have mentioned only ERCP. Most common complication of ERCP is only pancreatitis. 
So, in fact, I can reduce the incidence of pancreatitis by giving yes, rectal suppository, rectal diclofenac suppository. If I give rectal diclofenac suppository, the incidence of pancreatitis decreases. Okay, they used to even give indomethacin, some analgesics. So, NSAIDs will reduce this incidence. Incidence of acute pancreatitis following ERCP is reduced by giving NSAIDs. Okay, usually we give rectal suppository of diclofenac. A patient was diagnosed with PL2 hernia. What is the most likely hernia the patient is having? So, the patient is having PL2. This is an European hernia society classification. So, new question, but already we have discussed in our material. You can see we have discussed this concept in our classes. European hernia society classification of inguinal hernias. So, for example, this is mentioning as PL2. What is mean by P? So, P stands for primary and if it is mentioned as R means R stands for recurrent. If it is a primary hernia or a recurrent hernia. L stands for whether the hernia is seen lateral to the inferior epigastric artery or medial to the inferior epigastric artery. L stands for lateral to inferior epigastric artery. M stands for medial to inferior epigastric artery. F stands for femoral hernia. The most important 2, 2 stands for 2 finger entering the gap, the defect 2 finger is entering. So, 1 means 1 finger, 2 means 2 fingers, each finger is 1.5 centimeter. So, therefore, 3 centimeter defect. So, therefore, this is a hernia which is primary lateral to inferior epigastric artery with the 3 centimeter defect, lateral to inferior epigastric artery is indirect hernia. It is indirect hernia. Please do not forget it is primary indirect hernia is the answer. For example, if I tell PM3, what is it? It is primary direct hernia with a defect of 4.5 centimeter defect. So, primary direct hernia with a 4.5 centimeter defect is called as PM3. Please do not forget this PM3. Okay, very important point for your exam. 70 year old patient was operated with the midline laparotomy incision for adenocarcinoma. He is having a midline laparotomy. He is having operated for a midline laparotomy. He is a gap. Now, there is a defect of 12 centimeter gap through which hernia is happening like this. So, there is a hernia with a 12 centimeter gap is present. What should be the ideal treatment for this patient who is having a 12 centimeter gap like this? What is the ideal treatment? So, there are two methods of treatment commonly done in practice. Either one is I will reduce the contents and I will keep a mesh like this anteriorly like this. So, this is anterior approach in which open onlay mesh repair, open onlay mesh repair. This is called as open onlay mesh repair. So, another method is if this is the hernia which a bowel is going out, reduce them inside and keep a mesh from inside. So, that is known as laparoscopic I palm, what is I palm? Intraperitoneal onlay mesh. Intraperitoneal onlay mesh is used in those cases. So, that is known as I palm. So, for an incisional hernia, I can operate it from above open technique or you can operate it from inside and keep a mesh. So, this mesh usually used here is a dual mesh. It is not pure proline mesh in which the upper part of the mesh is made up of proline. The lower part of the mesh which is facing the bowel is made up of vicryl or polyglycolic acid and this is proline. So, two coating, the one proline side will go to the abdominal wall and the polyglycolic acid will be coming to the outside. So, this is a cl classical case of push the hernia back and do the mesh repair. Push the hernia back and do the mesh repair is the correct answer of this 19th question. Please do not forget. So, a patient was operated for laparotomy, patient developed a complication after operation. So, following a laparotomy, he has developed a wound breakup known as burst abdomen. So, that is what is the surest sign of burst abdomen? Burst abdomen is also called as wound degissence. Wound degissence. So, the first sign or the initially before the bowel comes out of the abdomen, there will be a sign known as salmon sign. Salmon sign is sudden gush of serous fluid. 
sudden gush of zero sanguinous fluid from the wound is known as salmon sign don't forget this sign so before the bowel is going to come out you will have a sudden gush of fluid coming out of the bowel most important point for your exams so 21st question 3 days back urinary catheterization was done for a patient but for some reason the catheter was taken out few days later he presented with the following image this is a classical image just now we discussed known as necrotizing fasciitis see necrotizing fasciitis if it is going to happen the patients are usually immunocompromised patients only this patient is having a furnious gangrene furnier gangrene is a necrotizing fasciitis of scrotum Melini gangrene is a necrotizing fasciitis of abdominal wall. Please don't forget it is a necrotizing fasciitis of abdominal wall is Melini's gangrene. Fournier gangrene is scrotum. So the immediate treatment we should do for them is extensive debridement. Not simple debridement. We have to do extensive debridement. You can see the skin goes for necrosis. But the problem is the skin is only limited. The skin necrosis is up to this place means when I go for debridement, it will be extensively spreading even to the normal looking skin area. The skin looks normal, but necrosis will be extending below. It is a rapidly spreading subcutaneous infection. Please don't forget this. There is a very interesting point. Testis is not affected. Don't forget this point. Because tunica albuginea layer is highly resistant to infection. Protects the infection entering the testis. So, testis therefore goes for shameful exposure after debridement. So, we have to do closure, delayed closure will be done for the shameful exposure of testis. We will be doing a delayed closure after few months. That is very important. So, this is Fournier's gangrene, classical repeat question. Okay. 75 year old male presented to OPD with a complaint of difficulty in swallowing initially for solids. And now for liquids, there is a history of significant weight loss. See, this two questions will be coming for your exams. I want you to remember one is from Achalasia Cardia. See, from this discussion, you can see many times the examiner wants to know whether you can diagnose. That's all. They are not even worried about how you are going to treat it or how you are going to investigate it. The simple question they are asking is, diagnose this disease. That's enough for me. That is what the examiner expects from you. So, Achalasia Cardia and Cancer Esophagus. So, first of all, you should diagnose what is the two features in these cases. So, please do not forget, achalasia cardia is common in young females. First point, cancer esophagus is common in old males. Achalasia cardia will have dysphagia for more than 6 months. Cancer will have dysphagia less than 6 months. In other words, rapid dysphagia. Here it is slow dysphagia. In achalasia cardia, there is liquid dysphagia more common than solids. Whereas in cancer, solid dysphagia is more common than liquids. Okay. So, achalasia will have the classical finding of narrowing, physiological narrowing of LES. It is a physiological tight LES. It is a physiological tight LES. Therefore, if I put a solid food particle like a chicken, it will easily go inside. But a soup or a liquid one will not go inside. Whereas cancer is not like that. Cancer is a irregular thickening or growth into the lumen of the esophagus. So whatever you put initially, uh, liquids can go between the gap. But solids will never go. They will remain above like this. So solids more than liquids is cancer. Liquids more than solids is achalasia cardia. So there is a history of significant weight loss. What is a gold standard investigation in this patient is achalasia cardia means gold standard is high resolution manometry. In cancer esophagus, I should do endoscopy and biopsy. That is a gold standard investigation to diagnose. So for a cancer esophagus in this question, I should go for a endoscopic biopsy. That is answer for this question. Endoscopy biopsy must be done for 22nd question. So please don't get confused with the history questions. Breast cancer surgery 10, 10 years back. Now she presented with the swelling of the upper limb with the bluish colored nodules. That's a classical clue. So a patient who underwent mastectomy comes to you with the bluish colored nodules in the upper limb. That is nothing but the classical complaint. The patient might have had lymphedema 
and that lymphedema usually happens after axillary dissection can happen after axillary dissection or after radiotherapy will now after 10 to 20 years if there is a lymphedema after 10 to 20 years they will develop lymphangiosarcoma so lymphangiosarcoma this syndrome is called as stewart trevis syndrome this syndrome is called as stewart trevis syndrome so don't forget this point it is called as stewart trevis syndrome and breast cancer surgery has been done 10 years back patient comes to you with the raised cutaneous lesions in the upper limb what is the likely causes lymphangiosarcoma that is stewart trevis syndrome is the cause here this is a straightforward image based question chronic male smoker presented to hospital with the fever malice and lethargic symptoms is also complaining of hemoptysis in the early morning he has lost 10 kg in the last two months i don't want to read anything i will directly go to the x-ray from the x-ray you can see cannonball mets cannonball mets are classically seen in this patient cannonball mets are most commonly coming from rcc renal cell cancer or it can come from seminoma so may, most of the metastasis will produce mets like a cannonball appearance so this is metastasis to lungs will be the better answer of this question so the answer for this question is metastasis showing you cannonball appearance see the cannonball cannonball multiple cannonball in both the lungs okay which appendicular cancer is commonly associated with pseudomyxoma peritoni see i want you to know what is first of all pmp this is known as pseudomyxoma peritoni it is a completely new question for your exams definitely fmg exams this topic you would have not read it's a total new question please understand hereafter this question is becomes a repeat question understand this concept so this is an abdomen cavity the abdominal cavity is entirely lined by peritoneum it is fully lined by peritoneum fully lined by peritoneum so the peritoneal lining is seen all over the abdominal cavity that is full of peritoneal cavity showing you uh, this picture so now some tumors from the abdomen can spread to this peritoneum and it can produce peritoneal malignancy known as pseudomyxoma peritoni so peritoneum will secrete mucin like this so that mucin will be found all over the abdominal cavity they will have mucinous ascites so this mucinous ascites is classical finding of these patients mucinous ascites so when there is a mucinous ascites you will have unilateral or um, ascites with a no shifting dullness may be there unilateral or absent shifting dullness may be present in these patients so but how does the peritoneum get the malignancy is a question how does it get the question is most commonly it gets from an appendix neoplasm known as appendiceal mucinous tumors appendiceal mucinous neoplasm when it ruptures when it ruptures it causes this problem of pseudomyxoma peritoni when it ruptures it causes this problem number one this is the most common cause in females ovarian mucinous neoplasm that can rupture and cause the same problem also very rarely mucinous cancers mucinous GIT cancers can also cause this problem so whatever it is there will be mucin everywhere in the abdominal cavity there will be mucin and this is answer for this case which appendicular cancer is commonly associated means mucinous adeno cancer and these patients need a major surgery known as cytoreductive surgery this is very well updated in bailey and love you can see a very beautiful image of this disease and surgery that is why they have asked it this year cytoreductive surgery plus hypac is done for these patients hypac is hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy we will pour chemotherapy into the abdominal cavity that is called as hypac we will pour after removing many structures in the abdomen we will pour the chemotherapy into the abdomen will for 12 to 14 hours this procedure extends for 12 to 14 hours it's a major surgery and but the patient still have a bad prognosis so please remember pseudomyxoma peritone may be a future question for your exams see neonate is diagnosed with gastroschisis so this again a repeat question what is the management of this case gastroschisis is a defect in the right iliac fossa 
with the umbilicus normally attached. See, this is normal umbilicus. Defect is in the RIF. Defect is to the right of umbilicus and there is no covering membrane through which angry looking bowel comes out. So, the bowel is coming out without a covering membrane. So, in gastroschisis, no covering membrane. In seal, you have covering membrane. Gastroschisis is very dangerous because it is associated with intestinal atresia. It is associated with intestinal atresia. Therefore, they have a poor prognosis. Compared to seal, they have poor prognosis. And seal can be slowly reduced with a silo bag because it is having a covering membrane. But gastroschisis needs immediate surgical wall closure and repair. Emergency surgery needed. Emergency surgery is needed for these patients. Emergency surgery is needed for gastroschisis. So, please remember, usually gastroschisis defect is very small, not like amphalocele, a huge defect. Therefore, gastroschisis, immediate surgery and closure and repair is done. Okay. Slowly putting it inside silo black is done for amphalocele. Waiting for it to resolve slowly is also done for examphalos minor. Example is minor, we can wait it to resolve. Okay, So, we do not excise the gastroschisis, only we do surgical closure and repair. We should not excise any bowel unless there is an atresia. So, answer, best answer is A. A patient is posted for major surgery, what is the ideal INR value that should be? So, please do not forget INR is equal to prothrombin time of patient divided by prothrombin time of normal people, normal lab. So, this is a comparative value. The normal value is usually 1. INR is normally 1. That is the correct value of INR. So, if you measure your INR will be normally 1. So, when INR is patient is posted for surgery, INR should be less than 1.5. Then only you can do surgery. Otherwise, there will be bleeding. When INR is more than 1.5 and if you need to do surgery, what should I do? If it is an elective surgery, if it is an elective surgery, I will give injection vitamin K and reverse the INR. If it is an emergency surgery, what will I do? I should give fresh frozen plasma and take for surgery. So, do not forget, if INR is less than 1.5, you can do surgery. More than 1.5, if it is elective surgery, vitamin K for 3 days will correct it. If it is an emergency surgery, FFB should be infused and take the patient for surgery. So, where what is the use of this INR? So, it should be taken for surgery when it is less than 1.5 is the correct answer. So, there is INR monitoring essential. Monitoring of INR is done for whom? Patients on what therapy? Warfarin therapy. Warfarin therapy is given for patients who are having DVT. We should monitor the patients with INR. So, those patients, the monitor value should be what? Value should be between 2 to 3 is ideal. When a patient with the DVT is managed by warfarin, maintain the INR between 2 to 3. That is the ideal value of INR in warfarin therapy patients. So, do not forget warfarin therapy. What is the value needed? 2 to 3. What is the value needed for surgery? Less than 1.5. What is the most likely age to be classified as biliary atresia? Please do not forget, I already told you, this is extrahepatic biliary atresia. This is a disease in which we have discussed in our uh, regular lectures, the bile duct inside the liver is normal, but outside the liver it has become atresia. There is no bile flowing out. So, the patients therefore comes to you with a pathological jaundice. See, normally physiological jaundice is up to 14 days. So, up to 14 days, they will not have serious uh, fear and mostly we will tell the patient, do not worry, up to 2 weeks, it is physiological. But when the jaundice is present for more than 14 days, the most common cause is what? It is neonatal hepatitis. That is the most common cause. But it is treatable cause. But dangerous cause, second cause is what? Extrahepatic biliary atresia. So, usually they come between 2 to 4 weeks, the patient comes to hospital. So, immediately you should evaluate it and confirm there is biliary atresia and do an emergency surgery. What is it? 
emergency procedure what is done for this cases it is kasai procedure so kasai procedure is a procedure in which i bring a bowel and anastomose with the liver so that the bile will be draining into the bowel and jaundice will resolve known as porto enterostomy but treatment of choice is what treatment of choice is we have to plan soon for liver transplant don't forget this question so we have to plan for liver transplant at the earliest possible so initially you can do kasai procedure it is a time buying procedure but as early as possible we should do liver transplant for a biliary atresia they come to you at two weeks extra hepatic biliary atresia comes to you at two weeks so 29th question i have already discussed a newborn baby was brought to emergency with a bilious vomiting bilious vomiting abdominal distension x-ray shows multiple air fluid levels no air under diaphragm means there is no perforation baby is stable but baby is continuously having uh, vomiting so when i take an x-ray if there is a single bubble appearance it is congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis when there is a double bubble it is duodenal atresia when there is triple bubble it is jejunal atresia when there are multiple bubbles please remember that is mid gut problem that is either a malrotation or a valvulus so what is that investigation to confirm it is a malrotation of gut is investigation of choice for malrotation of gut is gastrographin study you should make the baby drink a glass of gastrographin and take x ray gastrographin study is done so the answer is a you have to make the baby to drink a glass of gastrographin and do the test it is gastrographin study so don't forget this is a very important point 29th question is a gastrographin study the diagnosis is malrotation of gut see the problem happens in fmg exams is every question they never give the diagnosis they want you to know the clinical symptoms to make a diagnosis so therefore i am telling you first basic thing in fmg exam preparation is know all the clinical diseases their symptoms after that it is very easy so even in practice when we are practicing also the toughest step in practice is to diagnose a case once we diagnose a case we know the investigation management everything is easy but diagnosing a patient in a op practice is like an exam it is daily like an exam so if i'm seeing 25 op per day the 25 op is like an exam for me so therefore as fmg exam students we expect you to diagnose the cases if you diagnose the cases don't worry that is you are you have treated the patient more than 75% just by making a correct diagnosis so the answer here is malrotation of gut we have to do gastrographin study and once it is a malrotation of gut treatment of choice is what lats procedure it is lats procedure don't forget this point the treatment of choice for this procedure is lats procedure so which of the following management is preferred in severe acute pancreatitis see there are acute pancreatitis we can divide it into two types one is mild cases and another one is severe case in which there is bp low organ failure is present and all we call them as severe so i don't know whether they have gave any clue in this question but there is no proper clue and the choices are also not properly recalled but an acute pancreatitis please understand the question is related to nutrition and iv fluids and admission related question this is from a paragraph in bailey and low from the paragraph mild cases you can give oral fluid oral fluid and observe in the ward itself general ward itself you can observe this patients whereas severe cases i should give iv fluids and i should shift them to sicu in fact for nutrition they may need total parenteral nutrition mild cases we can give nasogastric feeding so i don't know the exact choices but from this question i can tell if it is a severe case of acute pancreatitis i will go for iv fluid and admit in sicu that will be the better answer in this question for 30th question iv fluid and admit in sicu a patient admitted in the hospital for a long time following which patient developed swelling and pain in the left leg so no doubt it is dvt happening in the hospital so what is the investigation of choice for dvt it is duplex scan there is no difficult it's not a difficult question it's a simple question for dvt investigation of choice is duplex scan most common site of dvt is what calf veins 
and what is the criteria to say it is DVT that is known as Wells criteria. Wells modified criteria. Modified Wells criteria is used to diagnose DVT and also to diagnose pulmonary embolism. There is a criteria known as modified Wells criteria. Just know the name here. You can read in your regular class discussion, but this is duplex study for DVT. So, this is a repeat question. Every year they are asking question from retrograde urethrogram. Retrograde urethrogram RGU is an investigation of choice for urethral stricture or injury. In a urethral stricture, I will put a tube through the penis and push the contrast back. If I am pushing the contrast back, I will find out two injuries. One is membranous urethral injury. Only two injuries, membranous urethral stricture and another one is bulbar urethral stricture. So, there are only two places I will usually get, but easily you can identify membranous injuries usually following a fracture pelvis. Bulbar urethral injury is usually following a straddle injury. It is usually follows a straddle injury means putting the two leg into the sacral bar or putting in the manhole that is known as straddle injury. So, we can easily identify this by seeing the image and this image is showing you the injury is in the bulbar urethra. So, I hope you know the anatomy of urethras. This is bladder, this is prostate, please do not forget prostate, prostatic urethra, membranous urethra is the shortest urethra, please remember it is the shortest thinness, this is membranous, then comes the bulbar urethra like this, bulbar urethra, then comes penile urethra, so this is bulbar, this is membranous, so when there is an injury in this area, when there is an injury in this area, we call it as bulbar urethral structure, in this area we call it as membranous urethral structure. See this picture explaining you the anatomy. Bladder, prostatic urethra, verumentanum, membranous urethra, bulbar urethra. So, bulbar urethral injuries will be having stricture in this place. Membranous urethral will be having here. So, now see the picture. So, there is a stricture in this place. Therefore, it is a bulbar urethral stricture. Do not forget this point. Simple image based question, but it is too much for an FMG exam. To identify the site of injury is too much for an FMG exam, but please understand it is bulbar urethral injury. You can get the same question again in the next year. 40 year old male who is having a pet dog in his home, he presented with right upper abdominal pain. On evaluation, there is a loculated collection in the liver. Which of the following is the most likely organism implemented in this pathology? So, this is a classical question on pet dog. So, pet dog means what? It is a classically hydatid cyst. It is a microbiology question. The organism is echinococcus granulosus. So, echinococcus granulosus most commonly affects liver. So, it will go to the liver and form a hydatid cyst. So, this is a question showing you loculated collection in the liver means what? Echinococcus granulosus causing a hydatid cyst of the liver. So, 55 years old male underwent lateral pancreatic jejunostomy. I hope you know the name of the procedure. This is a pancreatic duct which is fully opened out like this and removed the stones and stricture and we brought a bowel and anastomosed with this like this. So, this is a classical picture of bowel anastomosed like this. So, this is the stomach, duodenum and jejunum. So, just for understanding I am making this picture and I, this is a connection made here. So, it is a rule limb anastomosis. So, we have cut and this cut this bubble and brought it up and anastomosed like a lateral pancreatic jejunostomy. Can you tell me what is the name of this operation? This operation is known as modified pusto operation. Modified pusto operation. See, this is a very commonly done surgery by gastro surgeons. I am telling you again here for a lateral pancreatic jejunostomy, you need not worry. This is not going to leak because it is an isolated rule limb. So, now whatever you are going to eat is going to go through this way. So, this food will be going like this way. So, you can start on giving supplementary nutrition can be done via oral feeding itself. No need of TPN because in pancreatitis, GID is not affected. GID is normal. So, you can give normal oral feeding. So, following a modified pusto, you can give normal feeding via mouth. There is another question that is following a Whipple's operation for cancer pancreas. Whipple's pancreatico duodenectomy. So, this question, please understand it is a major surgery. In this surgery, we cannot start oral diet now itself. Therefore, we will start them on feeding jejunostomy. 
So for those patients, we will do feeding jejunostomy as a supplementary nutrition for people's operation. So this is modified pusto oral feeding can be started. This is what we do in our practice. This is a practice based question. A skin topic related to cancer pain is known as condyloma acuminata. Condyloma acuminatum is a what? It is a what? It can be known as Bushki Lowenstein tumor if it is very big. Bushki Lowenstein tumor is a name given for giant condyloma later. Such cases we should only go for excision, no doubt, because it is pre malignant. I have to go for a excision and send it for biopsy. Usually it is seen in genital areas, okay. Therefore, it should go for excision biopsy. Which of the following forms the lateral boundary of Hesselbach triangle? So, do not forget these are all very simple anatomy questions. So, this is anterior superior iliac spine, this is pubic tubercle, this is inguinal ligament and this is rectus abdominis muscle. So, please do not forget this is rectus abdominis muscle and do not forget this is external iliac artery which gives the branch from external iliac artery, this is inferior epigastric artery which is coming out and the triangle you are show, showing here, the triangle is called as SL batch triangle. So, please remember SL batch triangle is bounded by three anatomy rectus abdominis, inferior epigastric artery and inguinal ligament. So, inferior epigastric artery, rectus abdominis and inguinal ligament. So, what is the lateral boundary of SL batch triangle? What is the lateral boundary? Lateral boundary is inferior epigastric artery. So, please remember this point very important for your exam. So, this is inferior epigastric artery, rectus abdominis and inguinal ligament. It is a classical picture of SL batch triangle. So, this 37th question is a question on radical neck node dissection and modified radical neck node dissection. So, in radical neck node dissection, we remove level 1 to 5 nodes plus S submandibular gland plus parotid gland, not fully part of parotid gland. So, the same is removed in modified radical neck node dissection, 1 to 5 nodes, submandibular glands, part of parotid glands and also we remove S I S in R and D, that is spinal accessory nerve, internal jugular vein and sternocleidomastite. So, in R and D, radical neck node dissection, spinal axillary nerve, internal jugular vein and sternocleidomastoid is removed in radical node dissection. They are preserved in modified radical neck node dissection. So, preserve SIS in MR and D. Please do not forget this point. So, in MR and D, we have to preserve them. In R and D, we have to remove them. So, in modified radical neck node dissection, which of the following structure is not preserved is submandibular gland is removed. Okay, that is a very important basic point. So, there is a MEN1 related question, MEN1 syndrome, you all know very well, it is Vermeer syndrome. It is again a, a pathology as well as surgery question. MEN1 Vermeer syndrome will have P, 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 what are the three P? Parathyroid adenoma, parathyroid adenoma is seen in 100% all the patients. Pituitary tumor that is prolactinoma, what else one more P? That is a common cause of death, that is pancreas gastrinomas. Please remember gastrinomas are the most common cause of death. Most common cause of death is pancreatic gastrinoma. So, therefore, which is not included, pheochromocytoma is a feature of men 2A and 2B. That is a simple question on men syndrome related question. I am sure you all would have answered it correctly. 3P for men 1. A patient arrives to emergency department with a severe maxillofacial injury and his airway is compromised. Immediate airway is needed. So, leaf fort injuries. Leaf fort injuries are nothing but maxillofacial injuries. We, the, here, orotracheal and nasotracheal should not be done. Please remember, are contraindicated in those cases. Leaf fort maxillofacial injuries, you should not try to put a orotracheal or nasotracheal. Ideal way of putting an airway is putting into a tracheostomy is the ideal because there is fully nasty area this area is fully damaged you should not try to put anything into the nose or mouth we can cause more damage so as of now put a tracheostomy intubation and give the airway afterwards we will decide about proper other other management so for maxillofacial injuries tracheostomy is done 
the last question for discussion from surgery so this repeat mcq pet scan is an investigation of choice for metastasis patients many cancers we do investigation of choice is pet for doing that we use a radioactive substance what is that substance it is 18 fdg is most commonly used so most commonly used radioactive substance in pet ct is 18 fluorodeoxy glucose it is a co concept is the cancers which are having high ki67 index or otherwise cancers which are growing very fast they utilize more glucose so that they in they have increased glucose uptake so therefore instead of glucose we will give 18 fdg which will show you the uptake on scan so this will have false positive in whom false positive values are seen in diabetic patients and in tb patients you can have false positivity can happen in pet scan please don't forget so there are there are so many questions which are asked in fmj exam so these are some of the questions i got as a recollect so uh, i i'm sure these questions may be again asked in the next exam so please go through these questions again and again i'm telling you don't go through the questions again and again please go through the concepts again and again the same concept you should repeat that is more important okay thank you